interesting to talk about building soil biology and soil health really in relation to dry land farming in sort of northern Victoria or drier areas of Australia. Thank you, David. Thanks, Anne, very much for having me and Felicity. Um, thanks for yeah, having me along to the group. Uh, g'day, everyone. So, yes, Anne mentioned David Hardwick's my name. I live at Albury Wodonga. I moved here about six years ago from uh, northern New South Wales. Uh, we might get everyone to mute if you don't mind. If you're, yeah, if you wouldn't mind, just put your mic on silent just while, unless you want to talk, uh, just it throws my background out a little bit. Uh, yeah, so um, I moved down here about six years ago. I'm an agroecologist by trade. Um, you're probably wondering what that is. Basically means when you go through uni, you do agronomy plus ecology, I guess is the simple way to put it. I've had a mixed career. Uh, I've worked on everything from sugarcane, horticulture, and I spent some years in the central western New South Wales in Narromine. So, Ian, I'm pretty familiar with Narromine, Trangy, Ningan area, having done uh, cereal agronomy, particularly fertiliser agronomy and cereals out that way in the 2000s. I've got a few pictures to show you of some crop failures and other things out there. Um, yeah, so a bit, bit of a mixed career. The last 10 years, uh, I have done independent extension, so I don't sell products or not align with any products, but I've been doing extension in the sugarcane growing areas right through New South Wales and into the dairying dairy farms in Victoria. So I kind of cover a whole lot of farming systems, if you like. And yeah, been working obviously the last few years in the soil health, uh, regenerative agriculture space. My background was in organic farming originally, and that was uh, before I got into conventional agriculture. So I've kind of got a pretty broad um, sort of experience and exposure. And Craig, I certainly know AGF from up my work in the cane fields, because I'm up there about 15 days of a month. And a lot of the guys are taking up multi-species cover crops in northern Queensland. So I've been working with quite a lot of those guys over the last four or five years on those projects up there. Um, so I might, if that's all right, just share my screen, everyone. Uh, so I'll just try and do that. Hang on a minute. And jump straight in. I haven't prepared too much formally because it was kind of like a pretty broad topic that Anne's sort of given me in the fact that we're covering everything except how to install your kitchen. Um, and so I thought basically I'll just put a few sort of points together in sort of little subtopics, but it's kind of like a bit of a mishmash. Um, and it's just because we, it's sort of more of a Q&A session than me kind of preach from the pulpit or anything. Um, so feel free to jump in and talk and ask me questions. If it feels a little bit random, it's just because I've sort of lumped together different topics around soil health and regenerative agriculture uh, rather than just kind of some structured class. And Ian, I think your point, Ian was just talking before most people signed up before we started about the science behind uh, regenerative ag and stuff. And, and I think it's a really important point. And I think some of the practices that people are looking at and trialing, et cetera, and talking up are early technologies and early, you know, early techniques. And, and a lot of the time with early techniques out of the 10 horses that, that leave the starting gate, only one or two get to the end. So it's interesting, you know, some of these biological techniques we're seeing a lot of promise and others you know in five ten years they may have been a bit of a dead end i guess um, but that's the challenge when you've got new science and new practice sort of emerging um, but it is a challenge so yeah i was just going to jump through some different pictures and tell you you know show you some stories i guess from my experience and the growers that i've been working with and then make sure we try and relate that back to the Western Victoria sort of drier areas, although I know some of you in central Victoria are from different places. Um, yeah, so I thought I'd just jump in, but feel free to pull me up or um, put something in chat so we can catch it if you need to. So I've just put it in, put the presentation or the discussion around these kind of five dot points, if you like, regenerative ag, which I'll just really briefly spend five minutes on because it's such a big word and everyone's probably sick of that term. And then we'll get into a bit of the specifics around soil health. And again, feel free to really pull me up and talk about things. Soil biology I'll touch on and then soil plant and nutrition, which kind of leads into 
um, fertility inputs was the other thing that Anne wanted me to touch on, things like compost, biologicals, inoculums, etc. cetera. Um, I haven't put a lot in there on cover cropping, although that is a key pillar of what I'm calling 21st century uh, agriculture, um, especially multi-species or diverse, diverse cropping. Um, but we will see examples of that as we go through it. Um, so if you have any burning questions, as we've all mentioned, just put your hand up or put it into chat and one way or another we'll get to it. Uh, I have noticed that Zoom does not have negative feedback. They only have thumbs up and a clap. So if you're not happy with today, you can't, you have to turn your mic on and swear at me, but otherwise just use the clap or the um, thumbs up. So regenerative agriculture, really just a quick, my version of what it means um, because there is a lot of people use the term now. Um, I call it soil health based agriculture and obviously soil health is seen as the pillar or the foundation of regenerative ag. Um, this example here is probably one of the most interesting ones in Australia at the moment, I think. Uh, it's a vanilla farmer in the wet tropics of North Queensland. So we're talking three metres of rainfall a year, south of Cairns, very warm, a cold winter's day is like 19 degrees. Sometimes they get a little bit cooler overnight, but yeah, you'd be lucky for that. And the soil on the right is about 30% organic matter. The soil on the left, which is one meter apart, so it's the interrow. So the soil on the right is the vanilla bed. It's a commercial vanilla farm. And the soil on the left, one meter apart, is where they just mow the, the grass between the vanilla beds. And it's probably at about five or 6% organic matter. A cane field nearby on the same soil type would be running at 2% 2, 2 organic matter would be good. So you can see it's an example for you of someone that's significantly changed their soil. And I know at this point you're going to go, oh yeah, but they get three metres of rain. But I can tell you when you live in cyclone country and you get three or four metres of rain, they have issues around soils, just like you guys get the dry periods. But it's an example for you of how you can significantly influence soil structure uh, and soil function through management uh, and I'm not saying that's easy what they've done there and uh, it's pretty much blown away most of the soil scientists in the tropics because the general thinking is you can't build organic matter in the soil tropics because of the high temperature and the high respiration of soil microbes so most of the carbon gets breathed off into the air um, but under certain management approaches you can actually build it up. Um, so my definition hey, of yes um, and here just and yes. what, have, what did they do in that vanilla ah field? yes okay so very different than a cane field obviously cane is intensive cultivation unfortunately Ian they didn't jump on the no-till bandwagon as early as you guys so most cane farmers are only now transitioning to min no-till so the majority still do intensive rotary hoeing so a cane farmer will probably do two or three offsets after cane which is a tropical grass after the crop cycle and then they'll get in there with the rotary hoe up to six seven times before the next uh, crops put in so you can see they really work it hard um, what a vanilla grower does is they want to build a forest based soil and so it's a non-disturbance situation so the first thing they did was stop the tillage which helps and then the second thing was they started to use rainforest mulch because the problem up there the councils have is they get trees growing all over the road so they're happy to get rid of the mulch from the prunings and so they just lay it over 10 years mulch and then the third thing they did was put a shade cloth over the production area to mimic rainforest conditions so they're really trying to create rainforest conditions and and what that does is it slows down the respiration rate so you can mulch a cane field after they harvest cane there's what's called a green trash blanket because they've stopped burning cane now so a, a, a green trash blanket can be that thick after harvest and when they first converted from burning to trash blanket they were all told this is 15 years ago they were all told oh you'll get lots of humus built up in your soil but it didn't happen the organic matter in cane fields didn't change when the burning stopped and they went to this trash blanket because the respiration and the decomposition just turned it all into co2 it did have benefits it protected from erosion and it helps with nutrient cycling but it didn't lead to humus or long-term organic matter um, but what's happened in the vanilla is that you've lowered the temperature you've cooled it down it's um it just slows the respiration and you've given it lots of more woody organic matter which is more of a seriously a fungal forest soil type and that's created humus and it's 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 quite an astounding kind of result they they, they weren't aiming for that they were just trying to build a 
a mulch layer to grow vanilla in. I ended up at 30% organic matter after 10 years, which was pretty surprising for everyone. Uh, but that's the general things they did. Uh, and so regenerative agriculture in my definition, and Ian, this hopefully sort of gives you a bit of perspective, uh, I guess, on because I, I, I know, as you say, there's, there's the science of it. You know, people are questioning either for or against. But if you think about science in agriculture, which we talk about quite loosely, we go oh, agriculture is a science-based approach, which is fair enough. And we then have to say to ourselves, yeah, but which science is it? Is it physics? Is it biology? Is it chemistry? Is it maths? Well, it's pretty much all of those, isn't it? Really, agricultural science is a multidisciplinary science. It's like health. You know, it's not just health isn't just chemistry or biochemistry. It's um, psychology. It's nutrition. And it's the same with agriculture. So it, agriculture as a science has kind of different fields of science that make it up. And I guess the, the key one um, that's probably been missing from a lot of conventional agriculture over the last 30 years, even though some people would get angry for me saying that, is the ecology part of it. And ecology is really just getting everything fitting together, you know, how the animals, the plants, the soils, the science of how everything interacts. That's what ecology is. It's, it's the science of how everything interacts with everything else. So I guess ecology is just kind of that kind of that extra dimension and there is ipm or integrated pest management is a good example of ecology in agriculture probably you know it's it's it was a fantastic development and it's an example of where you understand the pest in the context of its environment and beneficials and everything else so that's an example of ecology and i guess we're applying a few more things from ecology when we're talking uh, regenerative probably a few more things than what say the conventional approach takes um, I, know, I know I'm using those terms very generally, but the multi-species cover cropping is a good example where that benefit of diversity in the landscape at all different levels um, has been, is really important for soil function as well as a few other things. So uh, I guess, you know, my take on it really briefly to finish it up is that we're broadening our focus. So we're not throwing out chemistry. Well, some people are, I know, but um, in my opinion as an agroecologist, we don't want to throw out chemistry and nutrition and plant physiology and pests and diseases and using chemistry where we need to. But we're kind of just maybe bringing in a few more dimensions to our thinking around ecology. And this is a good example for you. This is at Ningen, so Western Narrow Mine, Ian, where we were talking where you mentioned where one of your daughters is, I think. Um, so this is at a place called Hermidale, which is sort of right at the edge of the wheat belt going west towards Broken Hill Cobar. And this is a few years ago now. This is 2007. And this was what used to be called a biological farmer. Now they're called regenerative. And this grower here, Darren Mudford, was growing cereals uh, and he was trying to, you know, build soil health. And you can see that young wheat plant has a really strong relationship with the topsoil and so that's setting that plant up for the season pretty marginal country as those of you who know that area would know um, and so but what we're realizing is that the that's a two-way relationship that that plant and its roots is modifying that soil at quite a deep level um, how that soil's functioning and that that's really significant later in the season for water holding for nutrient cycling for disease minimization and so we're just realizing now that it's not just a one-way relationship plants get water and nutrients they also do a lot of things to the soil as they grow and that's probably the big change in agronomy perspective that's sort of taking place i guess so soil health, why does it matter, I guess, is the quick question. Well, it matters because your soil is an asset in your business and you need to keep your asset in working order. If you've got vehicles and sheds and machinery and tractors, you want them all to be in working order and soils are no different. They're an asset in the business. This was an interesting job I did in 2009 in uh, 2008 in, again, not far from Narromine, this job. This was when I used to work and do a lot of cereals. This is before the multi-species cover stuff, really. We really understood its sort of impact. But this is uh, the year that DAP went to $1,800 a tonne. I don't know what it was in Victoria, but we had it at $1,800 a tonne in 2008. And it was a global spike in phosphorus. And so everyone was chasing the product that I, the company I worked for made rock phosphate products, which that year were $500 a tonne cheaper. So a lot of people tried rock phosphate instead of DAP. 
um, just because of the price for no other reason. So this was a, 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 a grower that we worked with, Bob Lauke. Um, and on the left hand picture is early in the crop and he'd, the right hand side of that left hand picture, that makes sense. So the early picture of the crop, if I can get my little squiggly doodah going. Uh, the, this side here, uh, hang on a minute, I'll just get that chat out. Sorry, I've now got the chat coming up. Uh, yes, Craig, I know all about uh, sun hemp. Yes, and there's a few other people doing it. Sorry, I only just got the chat going. Uh, yeah, Prue, this is what we'll get to. This That question about the 350 mil of rain and do I have a, a plan available bucket of water for both crops? That's the big challenge in dry land. Do I have enough plan available water? I'll come back to it. But this is an example for you that might help start us answering that question. So on the left-hand side here is this was the rock phosphate based product and this was DAP and I think the DAP was going out at 80 kilos or something like that and it was up against a product that was equivalent of about four percent phosphorus so you can see it was a pretty pretty low analysis but also it was a rock, mainly a rock phosphate it did have some DAP a very small amount um, actually it was a seven percent analysis phosphorus so early on you can imagine that he would have rung us up which he did he rang up our company which was based in southern queensland and gave us an absolute gobful because he's saying what's this crap you've sold me this rock phosphate doesn't work um, and you'd be fair enough going <laughs> that's true but if you have a look on the right hand side at the end of the season so obviously there was a bit of in crop rain it's interesting to to note that the biological crop which is what we used to call them um, pretty neutral pH Allison yeah not there wasn't any major soil constraints like aluminium or anything like that here it was a pretty pretty benign soil type or soil condition um, and you can see how the biological crop actually caught up so the key thing about what I learned doing I, my job was R&D for this company so I used to do R&D yeah. on on um, these kind of products, compost teas, rock phosphates, all these mineral type products. But you can see how the crop caught up. And what we noticed and what we measured in the farm trials was that the plants that you give less soluble nutrients to tended to focus on building root systems. So they put more of their energy into, they allocated more of their growth or photosynthesis into root systems and yes they didn't grow nearly as quickly and you can see the crop on the right on the left hand side there is not nearly as ripe as the crop on the right so it took longer to ripen uh, and so they were slow they are slow and steady and it depended the, the whether it was worthwhile depended on two things when you got the rain because you can see that if you got rain later in the season that crop would still keep going and the second thing was uh, that really influenced it was the price of fertilizer. So if at $500 a ton difference, you can see that even if I had a lower yield, a little bit of a lower yield, I would still come out in front from a gross margin point of view. So I guess the point is that the yields were, uh, it was about, I can give it to you, it was about $10. I can't give you off the top of my head what the yield was I have written down, but it was about in the end when we crunched the numbers, it was about a $10 difference in the gross margin. But it was interesting, the fact that no one wanted to buy DAP that year in, this, in New South Wales because of the price of DAP going to $1,800 um, a tonne, uh, and it was really hard to get to, um, was made a lot of people do rock phosphate trials that they normally wouldn't do but it was a great example a chance for us to really sort of learn and have a look at things um, and i guess the rainfall was a really the timing of the rainfall was really critical here and but what we did notice was that plants that build bigger root systems what i learned was the plants that build bigger root systems tend to hold on better in dry years and in dry pinches, they tend to be a bit more resilient and keep ticking over. Whereas crops that bolt and don't have much of a root system, they tend to feel it, you know, and they're the ones that pull up first. Another guess, another reason I guess that soil health is so important is uh, for water, from a water point of view is infiltration. So one of the aspects of soil health is soil structure. So obviously if you've been doing no-till, you guys are well aware of the importance of soil structure and pores in the soil. And it, it has a profound effect on how quickly rain infiltrates into the ground. And this is just from a seven millimeter storm. And this is a grazing paddock in Burua, Southern New South Wales. This is from David Marsh's place. 
but it, the subtle thing about water infiltration is that porosity uh, influences infiltration really markedly. So if I go from a one inch pipe to a two inch pipe, when I'm laying pipe around the property, if I want to push more water around the property to troughs or whatever, to tanks, changing from a one inch pipe to a two inch pipe doesn't just double the flow. Does anyone know how much more water you actually push when you go from a one inch pipe to a two inch pipe? It's not just double. Does anyone want to have a guess? It's actually significantly more than double. Is it, does anyone want to punch anything to chat? Anyone brave enough to have a crack? It's a lot more water. I could use the S word, but suffice to say it's 10 to the power. I think it's 10 to the power of three. It's a lot more water gets shifted. So that's why when you see the grazing trials that were done on planned or rotational grazing by uh, Dr. Judy Earle and Professor Lewis Kahn in Northern South Australia, they were two of the first researchers to look at planned grazing versus set stocking. One of the things they saw within a couple of years of changing was an increase in water infiltration and it was a tenfold increase. And we're talking a 400 mil rainfall zone, the Northern South Australia. So they saw a significant increase in the amount of water going into the soil. And I think this is one of the factors that most farmers are well aware of, but sometimes in agronomy we forget is that soil moisture is as big a yield limiting factor as nutrients and you can't solve it with adding more fertilizer. It's a soil structural issue. But this is a one reason why soil health is, is so important. And we see the same in the wet tropics. When the guys get better porosity in the soil, the soils drain quicker. They get air oxygen in them faster and the, and the crops actually bounce back after a water logging event much faster. So it, this, the same thing applies. Here's a multi-species pasture. I know that sounds strange because most pastures, except for ryegrass in dairies, usually have more than one species in them. And I grew up in, or cut my teeth in the New England and New South Wales where <laughs> multi-species pastures, like you don't have to say they're multi-species because they just are. But you can see here that we've got a species, a dairy paddock near Finlay. Uh, not far from here, between here and where you guys are. Uh, and you can see that uh, the dairy farmer, John Hay, has sown in uh, a variety. Instead of ryegrass, he's gone away from ryegrass to what, what they're all calling multi-species pastures. And in fact, he's doing both a winter multi-species mix and a summer multi-species mix. So I think that's right, BNG or band 5G. Yes, uh, I think it's a factor of four. 10 to the power of four. So um, yeah, you can see here the some of the benefits that he's seeing is in cow performance, but also he's got his jagging feed in the summertime on the summer storm rain. Uh, last season with that tactic, uh, they were able to get three grazings for the dairy herd, which was a significant uh, you know, uh, bonus, if you like, just from sowing a, a paddock down because water's very expensive there. And a lot of them, as you know, are getting off the flood irrigation water because they can't afford it. So obviously he's doing other things, but one of the tactics is the diversity of plants. And there's more and more emerging science as well as practice experience from farmers showing that it has profound effects on soil function, just that level of diversity. Um, and it's something that I've seen in my career, especially over the last four years since these diversities of, uh, thanks, Thanks, Banji. I'll get, thanks for that. <laughs> uh, so soil health, uh, this is another example. This is an example from Northeastern Victoria, and this is a trial being done with an aerator. So this is near Wangaratta or to the east of Wangaratta on very light granite soil, low fertility soil. So the guys are trying to get, grow more grass without adding fertilizer, to, well, trialing to see whether there's other limiting factors. So they're using a, an aerator uh, and um, you can see the soil on the left, which has got the aeration trial going. You can see how bigger the root volume is. And so obviously that plant on the left, the water cycle and the nutrient cycling of the, of the soil on the left is much more effective than the soil on the, on the right, on the left, sorry, the one on the right is more effective than the one on the left where the treatment, the aeration treatment isn't being done. So soil health is about structure. It's about aeration. It's about root volume. It's about root depth. 
these are all specific aspects of soil health because sometimes people use the word soil health and we get really warm and fuzzy. And as soon as I say my soil is healthy, everyone feels hormonal and happy for me. But we really need to have a look at what the specific agronomic benefits of it are. Is it helping me with specific agronomic benefits? Um, here's one over near home here in Myrtleford on an old tobacco, old tobacco floodplain near Myrtleford on the on the river there and these guys are growing pumpkins, commercial pumpkin growers, and they're also trying multi-species cover crops. And the one on the left, which had significantly more diversity in the mix, um, grew more biomass. It was quite impressive. The one on right didn't quite grow the biomass, obviously had plenty of moisture around. But again, it's that diversity. And here's a final example for you before we jump in and have a look more at soil, soil health a bit specifically. This is a North Queensland cane guide. So there's sun hemp in there, Craig, for you. Um, that's a four-way legume mix uh, with sunflowers. So it's four different legumes plus sunflowers. And the problem that the cane guys have that you guys haven't got, and hopefully you don't ever get, is that they are now legislated how much phosphorus they can put out and nitrogen that they can put out on their property. So there's actually state legislation because they live next to the barrier reef on how much nitrogen they're allowed to put out and how much phosphorus. There's legislation on the type of soil test that they're allowed to take. There's legislation on how much myself as an agronomist could recommend that they apply based on that soil test. So the, the, the guys that are looking to adapt and change are starting to try and build soil health. And one of the ways they're doing that is cover crops. And the second thing that Alan Lins, his name, this is a cane farmer at Ingham, Alan's doing is he's trying to get more nitrogen in his organic matter biomass from the legumes. Uh, and and what's happening is they're able to lower their nitrogen. So Alan's, and we've made a YouTube video on him if you want to look it up, uh, his nitrogen's gone from 180 units of nitrogen, so that's kilos of nitrogen per hectare, 180, I know that's very different than you guys, uh, to 120 units. So he's reducing his nitrogen fertilizers and his yield is going up. And that's because he has much better root systems, more efficient uptake of the nutrients when they're applied. Um, so yeah, soil health is is trying to build these efficiencies in our topsoil, whether you're in the wet tropics or in dry areas, those, those, those non-nutrient limiting factors so that when we add nutrients, we're really optimizing the potential for them. Um, and last one here is an orchard, just to give you something very different. This is an avocado grower. Um, they won avocado grower of the year in the tablelands of North Queensland, the Atherton. But if you can have a look, you can see on the right hand side, the development of a topsoil. So the soil, used to look like that um, before the orchard was put in there and you can see through really good mulch it's mainly through mulching um, but also some uh, other tactics but you can see through really applied use of mulch and inter-row biomass the soil is transforming now into what we call a humus forest soil which is what avocados really like to live in and if you look carefully you can't see it from this photo but if you shake that layer in your hand it's full of feeder roots absolutely full of feeder roots and avocado trees that grow in a, in a topsoil where their feeder roots can fully express their genetic potential. They tend to have much less disease, much more efficient at nutrient uptake. There's a whole lot of benefits, much better water efficiency. And whereas where they keep the bare ground and the trees are always stressed because they're growing in Mars, basically they're growing on Mars, they tend to find, um, they tend to find much less efficiencies and more agronomic issues that they often need more chemicals for. So we've done quite a lot of projects up there, sort of projects because there's so much money for the barrier reef. So that's why I've been up there a fair bit the last few years. Uh, and here's a grazing example from central, the dry parts of central Queensland, where the guys are using rotational grazing to really re rehabilitate. This was an extremely scalded gu active gully head of about an acre and over just using mob, uh, putting a big mob of cattle in there for overnight, a couple of thousand animals, I think, or over a thousand animals, and plomped them in there with hot wires, left them there, and then rested it for 12 months. And you can see how it's really, really rehabilitating. So there's different ways that you can build soil health. There's not just one magic bullet, and but the common sort of principles apply wherever you are really in Australia. And 
the last thing that people obviously are starting to really do is look at adding extra things that they can buy or make like biologicals. And here's a couple of cane farmers at Mackay that got into the big time. They got into fermenting their own biologicals on farm at scale. They don't muck around. There's three brothers. They thought we're going to get off nitrogen. We use 180 kilos of nitrogen a hectare. We're just going to get rid of all that and just go to biologicals. So that's called uh, yeah, doing your own experiment and pulling the plug. So there's all these kind of things going on and just because it feels good and it's got green leaves on it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right answer for you. But this is the other thing people are doing is using some of these biologicals. So if you're wondering, Ian, um, should I jump into this space? Just be aware that when you go regenerative, not only do you have all your normal products to buy, chemicals and fertilizers, you've got all these extra biological ones to spend your money on too. So you can really minimize your tax even more. Um, or you could just spend half your day making them on farm yourself. But again, people are using other inputs apart from our normal or con conventional fertilizers and chemicals, and we'll explore them a little bit too. Uh, and this is a broccoli grower. I used to live in a horticultural area called the Granite Belt. I did live there for a long time and did agronomy there. Uh, and this was uh, one of those aha moments. This is a, a very professional bro broccoli grower that I used to work with. And uh, he was sort of going to more biological fertilizers. This is before regenerative came into vogue, the term. And he started to use compost uh, on very sandy granite country. Uh, and he said to me, Dave, the, the year I started using compost, I halved my urea. He still got the same yields and he halved his urea. So it was a great example of getting efficiency in nutrients. Like he really stabilized his nitrogen cycle in that soil. Um, still getting really good yields and even growth, which is the other great thing that he achieved. Uh, and again, here's a corn crop with biologicals applied and less soluble fertilizer. So intensive tillage, no, no control traffic. Um, and one side of that paddock had significantly less uh, fertilizers than the other, but you can see they're quite similar. So I guess I just wanted to sort of show you those examples. All of them use different tactics. All of them are from different climates, but they're all trying to achieve the same thing. And that's improve the functioning of the soil asset, um, I guess is the key thing. Felicity's thrown in there um, an update paper from the GRDC. And I think the other thing Felicity is the CRC for soils has got a couple of key national sites on multi-species cover cropping, which I think are gonna be really exciting as well. Um, maybe this one's one of them, but the, the one in the wet tropics is definitely showing a lot of promise. And I know there's a couple here in Southern Australia. So um, this Im importance of diversity is, is we're realizing that it's quite, um, quite important, but how we apply them is the key challenge. How can we apply these technologies? So what is soil health? Well, here's a vehicle that you guys are looking to buy because you've seen it on Gumtree and you've rung me up saying, I'm interested in buying that vehicle. And so when you rock up, there's a few things you're gonna ask me and have a look at when you look at the vehicle. You're gonna be looking at the body condition. You're gonna be looking at the wheels, the tires, or, the, or does it blow black smoke? Well, probably before that, in this case, you're gonna be wondering even if there's an engine in the engine block, but you're gonna be doing a check and you're gonna say, Dave, you told me that was in good nick. I've, it's not in good nick, mate. I'm not giving you five grand for it. You're lucky if I give you 50 bucks for it. So you can see here that you're doing, you're doing a bit of a checklist to see whether that vehicle is in working order. You wouldn't worry too much about how much fuel is in the tank you can, because you can fix that. But what you are worried about is, you know, is the vehicle in working order? Can it do a job for me? I can put fuel in the tank. And that's the difference that I see between soil health and fertility. So we're, we're all comfortable with adding fertilizers to get a job done. But soil health is a slightly different aspect of soil management. Soil health is like maintaining your soil in good condition. Fertilizers and nutrients, you put them in depending on your yield goals and the moisture potential for the year. So they're kind of two, they're associated, but they're two separate um, management tasks with soil. And often people solve a soil health problem with more fertilizer. And there's no point in me putting fuel in the tank of that vehicle because I ain't getting to town until I fix the wheels and put, a gear, put everything back in it. And that's the difference between fertility management and soil health management, I guess. And so no matter what type of vehicle it is, you want to make sure it's in working order. And that's really the same with soils. And when a vehicle's in working order, it does certain things for you. 
It carries loads. It gets you to town and back. It carries passengers. It does jobs for you. And it's the same with soils. And I guess the key thing with an asset on your farm is you want that asset to do the job in the easy times as well as challenging years. And I guess that's the thing. If you're having a good year seasonally with rainfall, it's pretty easy to grow a crop. But it's the tough years, making money out of the tough years, that, that is when the asset really shows up for itself. Thanks, Felicity. Yeah, that's Terry Rose's project out of Southern Cross Uni. Um, so your soil is an asset in the business. And in fact, it's one of your business's most important capital assets, just like machinery and fencing and everything else. It's part of what we call your soil's natural capital. This is a, a farmer at Katupna who's doing a compost trial. Um, he's looking pretty stumped at the moment. And so your asset needs to be in good condition. If your farm enterprise, whatever it is you want to grow, whether you're growing pulses or cereals or pastures for cattle, it doesn't matter. You still need to keep that soil in working order. Um, if you're growing tropical flowers or um, pyrethrin and tassie, it doesn't matter. The soil still needs structure. So um, you, we need to maintain that soil in good condition. Here's a compost being applied near Narromine in New South Wales and some trials during the drought last few years. Um, so soil health is really just another way of saying your soil is in good condition. Is the soil in working order? It's, it's a, quite, I see it as quite simple as that. Um, yeah, exactly. So Ian's put in there that is there a difference of opinion regarding um, artificial fertiliser and pesticides or fungicides? Yeah, Ian, it's probably the big one. You've got some people in the regenerative farming space who are really adamant not to use any of those products which is similar to organic farming. And I started my career doing a traineeship on an organic dairy. So I'm really familiar with that approach. And then you've got other people that go, look, some of those products are okay. You know, they don't damage things too much. So you kind of got a full spectrum. And then you've got people that say, yeah, don't worry about them. They won't harm your soil. You've got the full gamut of thing. I guess the way I approach it is I look at the soil objectively. Like if you're using chemicals, um, like I had a call from a macadamia grower yesterday. They're using, I said to him, he said, I'm not organic. I'm using some chemicals and things, but the number of earthworms that I've got now in the topsoil and the, the balance, the tree growth, the evenness of my tree growth over the last four or five years since I've started mulching and doing a few things is phenomenal. So that's telling us something that if I've got lots of earthworms, it's telling us that the soil biological condition. So you kind of can see whether you're overdoing the fertilizers by other symptoms, if that makes sense, rather than just making a blanket statement. That's how I approach it as an ecologist anyway. I just go, well, let's have a look at the indicators. And one of them for me is soil structure, plant health, um, soil organisms like earthworms, um, because they are quite sensitive earthworms to certain chemicals. But there's no doubt that inputs do change things. So I don't think there's any doubt. Yep. And then Alison, that's the other big, <laughs> the other big regenerative principle that people ding dong over that um, the replacement approach. So should I, if I just take product off the farm, I'm depleting fertility over the long term. So yes. Yeah, so apart from nitrogen, which obviously is coming in from the air, hundred percent, all the rest of your nutrients are coming out of your soil minerals because they live in the sediments of the earth, pretty much all the other nutrients. Um, sulfur does cycle a little bit through the atmosphere, but apart from nitrogen and some of your sulfur, the rest of it's coming out of the ground. So yeah, that is the argument that I'm not replacing what I'm taking off. Yeah. And I think it's a fair argument. Um, I guess the counter to that is, are we really harnessing uh, how much of the soil are we really accessing if we have a com compromised topsoil? And I'll show you a few pictures of compromised topsoils in a minute, but I think it's a really important thing that we need to think through for sure. So um, yeah, hundred percent. So I guess soil health, it's a soil in good condition. And for me, when a soil is in good condition, it has good structure. So pretty sure everyone's pretty comfortable with that pores and aer aeration and porosity and is not compacted. It has a balanced soil biology, which is a pretty big topic in itself. So I won't try and deal with it all today in this sort of mixed, mixed bag little session, but suffice to say that you have a complex community of soil biology. And if I have a diverse balanced soil community, um, it definitely 
changes the functionality of the soil quite significantly. Uh, and the third one is having enough organic matter, which has carbon in it. So soil carbon lives in organic matter um, because that's the energy for the community. It's a bit like us having enough to eat. Organic matter is the food for that soil community. So those three things, uh, those three things are really um, sort of the, the three basic things. When you have soil health, you're going to have those three things, really. That's how I sort of see it. Um, Craig, thinking ecology, is it really, risk? Craig's put in there, thinking ecology, is it really realistic to think that we could ever convert only to compost and not use urea? Yeah, I guess, Craig, it's a really interesting one. Um, I think it depends a little bit on your yield goals, your enterprise and the soil type. So the cane farmers, there's cane farmers that are significantly lowering their end. I mean, we're talking about farming systems that traditionally could use up to 200 units of nitrogen per hectare, which the only people beating that in Australia that I know of are some of the dairy farmers I've worked with. Um, and that's a lot of N. And obviously in a four metre rainfall zone with an organic matter content of one or 2% and a cation exchange capacity of four or five, you know where most of that nitrogen is going to go. So that they are really trying to push the barriers and the guys that are using really good cover cropping strategies, if they can build up that organic matter, maybe they can use 50% less N. So this is where all the taxpayer money is going at the moment to can we lower the end for the barrier reef you know whatever your thoughts are on the barrier reef and farming and that's why i got there a lot because all these millions of dollars are being spent on this very challenge so i think it depends a little bit on where you are the crop the climate but i think it is realistic that we can significantly lower them and i'm working with a few dairy farmers in victoria including that one that i showed you a picture of his paddock and they've both gone off urea 100 percent so they have lowered their herd size they have lowered their herd size but the interesting thing from one of them in the Gippsland, who's a really good sort of business operator, who keeps all these numbers, his herd size drop, his herd size drops probably around 120 milkers, so from over 500 to around 400. Um, but his gross margin and his net profit on the farm was higher, and because he dropped his urea and grain out of the system, which was really radical. It's a really radical thing to do. So his carrying capacity has lowered, but his profit hasn't. And he's still got a reasonable yield. The yield per cow are still up with his neighbours. So, but his overall herd size might be lower. So I think, yeah, it's not a, definitely, it's again, one of these really interesting challenges if we're trying to transition, what are we aiming for, profit or lower yield? Or I think it depends a little bit on the farming system and a few things like that. Hopefully that makes sense without getting myself too much trouble. So why is soil health so important? Well, the reason that you worry about it, one, it's an asset in the business and we've sort of looked at the things it's done for in different situations. But the bottom line is that as an asset, it carries out key functions for us. It does key jobs. Uh, this is a high aluminium soil that wasn't growing very well. And then when we address the aluminium issue in the soil, obviously it really kick-started the, the growth. So it's not just about biology, obviously soil health, but it does key jobs for you. The first really important thing that a soil that's functioning well does is it captures and stores water. And this is obviously the big one that you guys are dealing with because water you're in water limited landscapes. But when rain falls, it either hit it either goes in or it goes across. It either runs off or runs into the ground. And obviously the best place for us to put it is in the ground so that plants can, um, can use it. Uh, and healthy soils have good structure, so their water cycle is optimal. And this is an example for you from Western Victoria on a dairy paddock. It has, a, it has over five or 6% organic matter. So if you looked at the soil test, you go, gee, it's, it's going well, but have a look at that structure. So, you know, that soil is not using the most of irrigation or rainfall water because of that poor structure beneath that very, you know, misleading almost top, top layer of five centimetres. So you can really see that that water cycle is critical. And the two things that part of the water cycle is the infiltration rate. And this is that first thing that I touched on before. If I can increase my infiltration rate five or six fold, then the heavy rain events, particularly the heavy storm events, I capture more of that water. And it's, it's those heavy storm events where I really want to capture that more of that water because they're the big, they're the big kahunas in the season. Uh, and then the other 
part to the soil water story is increasing the plant available water. How much of that water then stays in the plant available bucket? So to do that, I need to increase medium sized pores, um, small to medium pores. The large pores are for infiltration and drainage, and it's the medium and smaller pore, medium to medium small pores that are really important. And you can see here that that's the challenge here is that we've got to get porosity back in that next level. And the only way to do that is to buy Dave Hardwick's brown coal product. That's the only way he's going to get porosity back in that paddock. But you can see it's a change in management, in this case, grazing management, but there may be a place to do some strategic ripping. So obviously there's different tools in the toolbox, but changing that grazing management, allowing the plants to build bigger root systems is probably a big part of the fixing that problem. Uh, Ian's put in there the best crops we've grown in the last two years were where either vetch or cereal stubbles have been grazed hard. Yep. Yep. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. So I guess Ian, yeah, without knowing the full context of that, um, because I, I think the ground cover story is a longer term thing. So one bad, one hard year of use is different than hard, like this paddock here where that pattern of grazing um, and probably grazing too short too often because it's a prime milking flat. Um, that's not just a one year story. Um, it's over a couple of years, you know, it's a, it's a cumulative thing that builds up. Um, so I couldn't give you an answer without maybe talking a little bit more about it, but maybe we can come back to it a bit later in the session to have a look at the wider context of it. Um, so the second thing that soils do when they're healthy, the second really important function they play is they cycle nutrients. This is an interesting trial from the US on an extension project in grazing. And um, what you've got here is grass that's cut every, sorry, I'll do it from the bottom. Grass that's cut to two inches every, uh, every week. Grass that's cut to two inches every two weeks and cut to two inches every four weeks. And you can see that just by giving that perennial grass a little bit more time for it to re not recover from grazing, but between grazing events, it can allocate more photosynthesis to root volume. And that's what grasses like to do. They like to build a root system because that's what they've needed for, for a couple of hundred million years, or at least in grasses case, um, you know, tens of millions of years um, to maintain themselves, to access nutrients. So you can see here by just giving a bit more recovery, there's significantly more biomass underground going on. And the key thing is that most nutrients that plants access or all of them are coming from the topsoil. So when I have a bigger root system, one, I'm improving the aeration and the organic matter going in the soil from root biomass. But the second thing is I'm optimizing the nutrient cycling. So we could have a Olsen P of five or 10 or 20 in those soils. Let's say we've got an Olsen P of 20, but you can all see that this soil here with a much deeper root system is accessing more phosphorus than this one over here. The soil test might tell you it's got 20 Olsen P, but I know which soil's accessing more of the phosphorus. And this is that key dimension to nutrient cycling and nutrient availability is it's not just about what the soil test says is in the available bucket. It's about what the plants can actually take up for themselves because of a root system, which is the second part of the story that we sometimes forget. The other function that uh, soil, a healthy soil does is it provides an optimal environment for plant roots. So you get that full genetic expression of plant roots. And so they can access nutrients and water and also modify the soil around them because plants are in this two-way relationship with your topsoil and they do modify the soil conditions to suit themselves within, within the bounds of any soil constraints. Um, so uh, this here is a that pumpkin grower again, and they're trying to rehabilitate old tobacco soils, which are very problematic. So we're using cover crops, particularly ones with nitrogen and legume content, to just to try and get structure back in them, so that the following cash crops have can get their roots down and grow. Uh, Abby's Abby's put in there. What's the view on annual pastures in dairying? Yeah, I guess, Abby, for me, my, my view on it is the least, the least disturbance, the better. So annual pasture is like an annual crop. So if you're, if you're sowing annual crops, and I'm not saying they're not part of a dairy system at all, but if they're the majority way that you rely to feed the cows, then pretty much you're relying on it highly disturbed. Most of your farm's highly disturbed each year to grow them. Uh, and so what the guys that are transitioning to regenerative dairying, if I can use that term, 
the common element to them and there's there's three or four that i've worked with in the last couple of years that are all doing the same thing and they're going to more perennial pasture based systems they still might have annual fodder crops and um, forage crops in their farming system but it's not the majority of their farming system uh, and the key thing about annual systems even if you know till is that they're still quite intensive disturbance to some to a greater or lesser extent you're disturbing that soil uh, and that's what we're trying to minimize as much as we can i guess uh, if it rains a lot you want good cover if it doesn't rain much you don't want much cover yep so i guess b and g is that alluding to the fact that if um that i want to allow water in the ground i'm not sure what that statement means so if you might want to flesh that out more and i'll keep rolling and then i can come back and answer that one because i'm not quite sure what you're meaning by that um, the other two or the last couple of things that soil health does is it minimizes helps to minimize soil borne diseases and there's lots of science around this uh, particularly around the benefits of diversity to um, minimizing soil borne diseases like um, root rots and all the rest of it fungal uh, fungal diseases in roots etc nematodes uh, the, probably the most work has been done in sugarcane but in the grains industry, it's been done more and more. And horticulture, where there's quite a lot of work showing cover crops and their benefit on soil-borne diseases. There's heaps of Australian work now being done on that. And most veggie growers are pretty much using cover crops to help minimise soil-borne diseases. And especially the diversity of them is really important. And crop sequencing. Uh, this is an example for you of just building soil biology back. Sorry, I'm just getting going back. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, if you're not getting the water in the ground, uh, it won't infiltrate if you've got too much cover. Thanks, BNG. Yep. Yeah, especially if you, if you aren't, if you haven't, if you aren't getting very large rainfall events, if it's just really small rainfall events and you're not getting much effective rainfall, then obviously, yeah, that high level of um, ground cover may in, decrease infiltration. I guess the downside to that though is that you also got a higher temperature at surface which I'll come to in a minute as well which increases evaporation which is part of this whole soil moisture debate or challenge that we have because um, I can have a bare fallow. I might come back to it but when I have a bare fallow yes I store moisture but I also increase evaporation rate significantly over summer. Um, and so this guy here, this is a, a, a converting an old sugarcane field to grazing. So this is being regularly grazed and making quite a lot of money from livestock. It took four years before he saw an earthworm. It was four years before the first earthworm came back in that paddock. And yeah, it was a, it was a big day when the earthworm was found. But yeah, you can see here, but he was able to make money from that paddock while trying to rebuild it. In this case, he used animals. Um, so the final benefit or function that a healthy soil does, it's just sometimes we forget about, but it's important. Um, um, Craig, I'll come to that one in a minute. Is that when you have a topsoil that's healthy, and, and I do mean with ground cover BNG, so ground cover is part of soil health, and I can appreciate your argument there. I'm not saying that's wrong, but having some ground cover is really important. And one of the reasons is lower temperatures and evaporation in summer. And I think this is sometimes the other side to the equation that we miss um, i know you can have a bare fallow and build your, store, your soil moisture profile for the following cash crop but the downside is that you will um, if it's bare or quite quite exposed you do increase temperatures at surface and that influences the soil biological community it influences uh, evaporation and it also influences loss of carbon through oxidation so the organic matter, the carbon in your organic matter is getting lost to the air as oxidation of carbon over that hot dry period. But it also means less runoff. Uh, when I have a healthy soil, I get um, more soil moisture, less erosion, less dust. And if you've got more soil organisms, you will have more birds in the area as well. As anyone that's ploughed a paddock that hasn't been ploughed for years will know, you get lots of birds hanging out behind the tractor because they're coming in on that pasture phase. Um, so I guess in summary, no matter what type of soils you have, they all need to be in good condition. And I guess that's the key. You know, what does that mean, Dave? What's the specifics around that? And I guess that's things like good structure, the depth of my topsoil, like you saw that compromised dairy paddock before, you know, it's five centimetres of thatch and then it's, con it's just 
blocks. So really that's very poor structure and it's starting to set targets, but it doesn't matter what soil type you're on, wherever you are, we need to have a well-structured soil with a balanced soil biological community and adequate organic matter. And that might be different from you guys in a lower rainfall area to someone in the wet tropics, but I need adequate organic matter for soil function. Craig's got a question in there about diversity. Uh, how much do you have in mind? Yeah, uh, I guess there's different tactics as the way I understand it, Craig. One, you can have kind of different, there's different diversity cropping tactics. So you've got crop rotation, single species in rotation. That's a level of diversity. Then you've got intercropping two two plants in at the same time so oats and vetch for example in a crop or sunflowers and sugarcane as simon matson did up in Mackay, or we can go to a full multi-species cover crop in rotation uh, or we have a pasture that has uh, just some diversity in in the mix in the pasture itself and then you've got things like pasture cropping coal sizes technique um, obviously comes into it as well and how do you use to measure soil biology? Yep, so one way you can do it is with a spade and a tray, which we do in the workshops that we run and face-to-face -face workshops. But there are some soil biology tests. So there's three on the market, or there's, there's about four or five, but there's only pretty much, in my opinion, two soil biology tests that are kind of 21st century technology. Uh, and one of them is the this, uh, this microbiological laboratories in Adelaide. And the other one is the DNA soil testing, which is now being done through Metagen, a lab in Gatton. And then obviously you've got the SARDI, the, the, um, the nematode tests, uh, predictor, predictor tests as well. So you've got, um, yeah, soil your undies, Felicity. That was a good engagement and awareness activity. But yeah, um, I'm not sure it does anything more than that. And it's not scientific if you use dirty underwear, like it's got to be fully bleached, otherwise you're skewing the results. Um, but yes, soil your undies. Yeah, there is the calico strips and things. So there's lots of field ways you can do it. There's soil respiration meters. There's a whole lot of field ways you can measure soil biology. But, and there are some tests as well, Anne, but it's a bit of a topic. But I can send you through a few options if you need to. Um, and so basically just like that vehicle we looked at that vehicle where you've got a checklist for your vehicle or your shed or machinery you go through a bit of a checklist to see that it's in working order it's the same for soils and for soils you can just come up with a bit of a soil health checklist and and it's not too complicated so organic matter carbon does it have enough of that in it does it have the carbon and nitrogen ratio in balance um, which is the quality of your organic matter is the ph in reasonable balance is the soil salinity or, or are the, the cations out of balance like the aluminium or calcium or high magnesium or whatever it is. And obviously that's a little bit contentious. Some people have different opinions on what ideal balances should be, but basically, and do I have too high a sodium? Do I have a sodic soil? So there's a bit of a checklist and that's the checklist that you use from a soil test. But then obviously you can go out in the paddock and look at the rest of the soil health checklist and that's ground cover and litter soil structure, surface condition, is it crusting, root activity, do I have roots, are they growing very far, root health, uh, soil organisms. So there's, there's two ways you can assess soil health and you'd need to do both. So the soil test doesn't tell you everything. To, I think part of the problem with modern agronomy is that we've gone too much away from field assessment and we just rely on the computer printout to sort of identify our soil constraint. We've also got to get out and ground truth it and have a look at the paddock history and how the crops are going and you know what happened last year and what are the visual symptoms and disease issues and just do that sort of holistic agronomy. So they're the kind of two parts to the checklist for soil health. Um, and yes, soil biology or soil organisms is not necessarily black and white to measure, but there are ways to do it um, to make it objective. Just because you see one earthworm in your field, it doesn't mean that the, the show's all uh, okay. I know it'll make you feel hormonal seeing an earthworm, but it doesn't mean objectively that your soil is improving. So you've got to measure it objectively. So I just had a few dot points on soil biology here. A couple of blokes in the graziers in New South Wales many years ago now getting into their soil mites. Um, but basically, I guess this is a fundamental aspect of regenerative agronomy or regenerative agriculture that's, again, the words used really widely, broadly, without much pinning down the specifics of it. 
but here's that wheat plant again. And I guess the key thing that we now know that's probably really important and probably will shape, in my opinion, 21st century agronomy, and that is that the plant modifies the topsoil. It's not just the plant is, in, is growing and is a passive actor there. Plants actively modify the topsoil around them. Yes, there are soil chemical constraints that, that can limit some soils, but it's quite amazing, especially with the diversity tactics that we're seeing plants modify and moderate extreme soil constraints through diversity and some of the cover cropping but i'm not saying that they're the only tool i'm definitely aluminium and sodicity and a few other things definitely seem to pull up any most plants unless you deal with them but the the community that community that that young wheat plant lives with has evolved with that plant for tens of millions of years and just like we're really dependent on the microbes in our stomach the human microbiome is the, the jargon we're all using. In the same way that wheat plant or those trees in the distance there, they're all dependent on a really complex community living around the roots. And when you compromise that community, that's when issues start to happen. And some of those issues are plant health, etc. But the other issues are that you stop that soil forming process or soil organizing process that the whole community has. Because you can see that that root system and the microbes living with it and the minerals from the soil type, they're organizing themselves into a topsoil. I didn't, they didn't just buy Dave Hardwick's buckets of magic liquid and just spray it out. That plant is, and, and the community and the minerals are self-organizing. And the problem with too much disturbance is it kind of knocks out that organization process. Uh, thanks for that, Craig. I had to, we don't have time to look at it, but that's appreciated. There's quite a lot of those guides around. I'm not sure which one that was, but thanks for punching it in there. So that's, I guess, the key term we use in ecology is self-organizing or complex adaptive systems. And I know they sound like pretty complex words, but basically the whole system organizes itself into equilibrium if it within reason of the constraints of the site. Uh, Alison, uh, there are a few. <laughs> I really like the newest test. The newest lab in Australia is the DNA test done by Metagen, which is a, a new lab based in southern Queensland, uh, because it's high throughput DNA. So it's DNA sequencing. And DNA sequencing is pretty much the game changer because almost all the other methods, even the nematode analysis, the, the predictor B and A system, they're good tests, don't get me wrong, and they're still used and they're still really useful. Um, so those ones in conjunction with DNA is probably the best way to get it as complete a snapshot. Uh, those tests are running at around $200 and so the one in Adelaide microbiological laboratories, they do a, a microbe wise test it's called and the full sort of community snapshot test is, a, is 200 to 250, I think. Uh, and the one from Metagen, the other one is about, and I don't get kickbacks from any of these guys, by the way, the one from Metagen is around that same $200. But both of those labs are trying to do a community snapshot for you. So the other soil biology labs that are in Australia, they only, they use quite old fashioned techniques. Um, some would say petri dish systems and they're really not capturing the, system, the whole thing for you. So obviously the predictor A and predictor B, the GRDC or the SARDI developed one, that's quite a specific one because it's looking at disease potential from nematodes uh, mainly but, and other disease organisms. Whereas these two are looking at sort of the balance of your community. Um, they're kind of slightly different approach. So, but it, yeah, you do have to spend a little bit um, plants. I've got a friend who's a microbiologist at Forbes. He actually makes inoculum for a living, rhizobia for a living, the inoculum you put on your legumes. And so Dr. Chandra I, he'd be really good to give you a field day, but Chandra taught me a lot about soil biology and he reckons the best thing to measure soil biology is a spade. So anyway, he's a bit cynical a little, but I think the new DNA tests are showing a lot of promise. So plants have co-evolved with the community of soil life for, for over 400 million years. Obviously grasses are a bit later than that, but in general plants um, is um, uh, been around for that long. And since plants or life first came out of the water, onto hard land, they've had to depend on microbes, particularly fungi initially and, and bacteria. And so now there's this complex uh, relationship. And if we disturb that too much, 
uh, then we're going to have problems. So yeah, I guess Alan, you Allison, you're always going to have the pathogens. They're a natural part of the community. It's a bit like having Collingwood supporters in the pub. You're always going to have a couple, but yeah, it's just a matter of, you know, you don't want too many of them. So you want a mix of, of everyone in the pub. So I'm not an AFL person. I come out of NRL, rugby league, I land. So, but I like to stir the pot. So what we're trying to achieve. So I guess that's soil biology in a nutshell. I, I didn't put too much in there because I wasn't sure sort of how far we should go down the different topics, but yeah, soil biology, there is some good tests that are showing promise. The problem with it is, is that like some other measuring of soils, it can be variable from season to season. So I've just been reading some recent studies looking at the respiration because soil respiration kind of indirectly tells you how active your bacteria are. The more your soil is breathing off CO2, the more bacteria you have active. So it kind of makes sense. But recent work is sort of showing that just because you've got lots of micro bacteria breathing doesn't mean the soil's healthy. It just means that they're really active, but it, the soil may not be that balanced. So it could be hyperventilating, for example. So there's, yeah, the complexity of it's still there, but the new DNA and the microbiose test from microbiological laboratories in South Australia, they're probably the best too, if you do want to start to muck around with those tests. Are there any yield trials? This is from B and G, or I'm just going to call you 5G. That's easiest for now. Are there any yield trials to show that multi-species cover crops are beneficial to subsequent crop crops? There are trials to show that multi-species is no better than mono-species of similar biomass. Yeah, so I guess that's what's happening now, 5G, in terms of the CRC's national project on it. Some of the work from the US, some of the trials that I've seen just summary data on is definitely showing benefits of diversity. I guess the key question I have is, is does, does having diversity in the paddock, managing managed diversity, plant species diversity, help you with either short-term or long-term benefits following on? That's the key question that we have. What I've seen in the cane, sugarcane, it's probably, even though they're getting the baddest rap out of most cane farmers in Australia, um, they're actually really taking up multi-species cover cropping quite significantly, like it's being adopted quite widely. Uh, and what I've seen just from the field work with the growers that are trialling it is, there's no doubt that their soil structure and disease suppression, they're getting improvements. So that's not direct directly giving yield benefit to the following crop, but it's, it can, if they reduce soil borne diseases, then they're definitely getting yield potential. And that was shown with single cover crops uh, in cane rotations. But what we're seeing with the multi-species is structural improvement, quite significant structural improvement. And I guess that's, this is the science that's still emerging, but there's definitely, yeah, it's definitely sort of leading towards these a conclusion that having diversity in there helps with soil function, whether that increases yield, I guess is still to be answered in all situations but i think in some situations yes for sure um, and i guess sometimes it's an indirect benefit if i'm just sort of thinking that through so if i improve soil structure and that then helps me with better water holding capacity then that's obviously going to be reducing a yield limiter for the following crop but again the seasonal conditions are going to influence that as well which is why i think different yield trials sometimes give you different contradictory results it's because sometimes the other factors are also playing interfering or influencing the results as well um, so what we're trying to achieve so that's what the crc for soils is exactly trying to do answer your question uh, 5g sorry um, is james still pursuing research on this sorry i don't know james so i'll have to let someone else answer that No worries. Thanks for that, Therese. Yeah, you're doing the PhD on it, so I'm glad you jumped in there. Yeah, definitely what we've seen in Kane uh, is definitely quite impressive. Um, no, you're right, Alison. Def impressive soil, um, soil structural improvements quite quickly, which is something that's kind of surprised me. Um, so what we're trying to achieve, so now I'm jumping to the last sort of formal, second last formal topic for you, or keeping on rolling here, and that is we've got 15 minutes left, so hopefully I'm 
been covering things that are relevant to you guys because I'm talking to a blank screen. So hopefully you're all good. Um, I'll scoot through this. So what we're trying to achieve with fertility is balanced and adequate nutrition. Basically, you know, whether we're conventional or organic or regenerative, whatever term, we're trying to get balanced and adequate nutrition for the plants. And I guess I'd just like to sort of compare the two models. So Ian, maybe this will give you a perspective of the different ways for sort of people approach fertility, regenerative versus conventional. So, and I know I'm being simplistic because, you know, there's obviously great shades of gray between the two, but basically the general approach to a lot of commercial agronomy is what I call two bucket thinking. So you basically have your available nutrients, you know, your Olsen P for example, or your coal wool pea, and then your unavailable phosphorus, which you don't really worry about because plants can't access it. So you just worry about keeping your available phosphorus or sulfur or whatever it is, zinc or whatever nutrient you want to focus on, you want to keep enough in your available bucket. And the other sort of assumption um, behind this was that behind this is that it's quite a passive process. So the plant roots kind of take up available nutrients and although we know it is an active process, plants actively give out compounds and modify the soil to optimize their own nutrient nutrition. Surprise, surprise, they've been doing it before we come up with fertilizers. Um, it, the assumption is that I kind of need to top up this available bucket because it's a bit of a passive system. If I don't have enough in here, then the plant won't get it enough. That's kind of like the, the generalization. I know this, it is a generalization of the two bucket thinking sort of, I guess the more regenerative approach or more holistic approach to thinking about it more based on sort of 21st, what we now know the soil community plant root relationship is that what I call five bucket thinking. So in five bucket thinking, you only don't have two buckets to deal with. You've got five, so it makes it a bit complex. So the first one is soil air. So you're going, hey, Dave, plants don't get their nutrients from the soil air, but everyone knows that nitrogen comes in from the air. So as long as they've got nitrogen fixing bacteria, they are accessing that bucket. And that's one of the reasons that we have legumes to help improve that nitrogen fixing process in our topsoil. So that's obviously one bucket that if I don't use legumes or have any legumes in the system, I'm not going to be accessing that bucket, particularly for nitrogen. And so that's where some of the dairy farmers are at, where they just have ryegrass and urea. So the second one is the soil solution bucket, which is kind of like our available bucket that we talked about. So it is an important bucket of nutrients, but it's not the only one. There's still two more. The third one is the organic matter bucket which obviously I'm sure most of you, if you're in cropping in the GRDC, been familiar with the GRDC work, we know that nitrogen and sulfur and phosphorus get held in uh, organic matter and get released by microbes through mineralization to the plant. And as the plant dribbles more carbon and sugars into the soil, it stimulates microbes and the microbes eat more of each other in the organic matter and that drives nutrient cycling. So as your roots get bigger and more active, you actually stimulate mineralization. So it's a positive feedback for the plant. The bigger its root system, the more it pumps carbon to stimulate the soil community, the more the soil community eats each other and mineralizes nutrients. And so you can see that there's actually a, a strong correlation or relationship between root activity and nutrient cycling. And a lot of that bucket is through the organic matter bucket. Uh, then we've got the CEC or colloid bucket, which I won't go into today, but you know, calcium and magnesium and potassium are being exchanged from there. And the last bucket, which is probably a bit contentious for people that are very conventionally minded is that plants can take nutrients direct from the soil minerals, what we would traditionally call the unavailable bucket. So we now know that mycorrhizal fungi, for example, one example, which is a, a beneficial fungi that lives on your plant root and it can access locked up phosphorus. So the more I have mycorrhizal fungi living on these roots, the more it can tap into zinc, calcium and phosphorus are the three well research ones. So again, the bigger that community and the more diverse that community of beneficials and symbiotic microbes, I can access one, two, three, four, five buckets for my nutrients. 
instead of just saying, look, it's either available or unavailable. So I guess it's a slightly different, more holistic approach or ecological perspective. And I guess the question you ask yourself is, yeah, okay, Dave, I'm happy with all that, but is it realistic? Will I get enough out of here for my yield? And that's a fair point. And that's the big challenge we have. Can I build that whole community system up enough so I can minimize my soluble inputs into the soil solution bucket because I've really got the rest of the show really cycling and working really well. And that's the real challenge of regenerative agronomy, I guess. So I'll keep going. Everyone's still alive by the look of it. Those of you with a black screen, if you'd like to give me the thumbs up, you can't give me the thumbs down if you're bored because there's no thumbs down option. But if you'd like to give me the thumbs up, just so I know you're alive technically and you're not like playing Mario Brothers or something. Yep, all good. Thanks for that. Okay. Um, thanks, Dan. Righto. I'll keep rolling. Last little section. Um, I haven't had many questions, so hopefully it's going all right. So I guess I've just put together some kind of four steps for nutrient management, I guess, from a more regenerative soil health based approach. And the first one is to know your total fertility. So coming back to those five buckets, yes, we want to know our available phosphorus, but it's also a good idea to know our total. So you can get a totals test done. Here's an example of a number of soils across Eastern Australia and their total fertility. And you can see here, I've got total phosphorus of 1200 in this first clay-based soil in Southeast Queensland and a granite soil similar to your granites in Victoria, 89 total phosphorus. And a red soil, potato growing soil, like similar to your potato growing soil, 2300 total phosphorus. So you can see different soil types have different, here's calcium, 5000 parts per million total calcium. And on a granite type soil, I got 85 in the tropics and 650 in the non-tropic granite. So you can see different soils have different kind of overall stores of nutrients. And um, knowing that if we want to optimize the cycling, we've got to know what we have to cycle because we have to be a bit realistic. Uh, and so this, the second step in nutrient management, if we're taking a bit more of a holistic approach and not just relying on fill the available bucket, is one, know how much potential fertility our soil type has. The second one is let me maximize soil health because that will optimize nutrient cycling. Because a golden rule of regenerative agronomy is to optimize what you've already got and then add in on top of that. But if I'm putting high rates of urea out on a dairy paddock or a graze paddock where there's five centimeters of thatch and then it's concrete, I am not optimizing that nitrogen. So let's get as efficient as we can by improving soil health. And you can see that that those three grasses there, which one's going to have a more efficient nutrient cycle. And here's that, that other paddock from before. If I don't improve that soil health, the structure, the root volume, then there's no way I'm going to be using fertilizers efficiently. And the problem that you get into when your soil health is poor and your yields are going down is sometimes you try and solve the problem by putting more fertilizer on. And at that point, Ian, that's when I'd say to you that your, your solubility is going to start to throw out soil health when you're overloading the system. That's the problem. My old soil lecturer at uni had a definition of a soil pollutant is anything that the soil can't assimilate and process. So it can, it can process nitrogen if you add it or phosphorus, as long as it has plenty of organic matter and lots of life and roots, it will cycle and process that nutrient. But if there's none of those things, well, it'll just sit there and flood the system so to speak. And that's the problem that then it becomes a pollutant. And the problem is we kind of think, oh, well, let's, we'll solve the problem with more fertilizer. Unfortunately, the cane industry has got to the point where they're now legislated. Um, and I can't blame cane farmers because they were kind of given all this advice for many decades. So we're trying to build roots. We're trying to improve soil biology and roots are a key part of that. Uh, Jared, I, Jared, I reckon the worst thing for soil health is lack of living plants. That's, and I'm not talking about water because water comes and goes, but if we just if, assume we have some water at certain times, then we can go down the kind of hierarchy of what, so disturbance and lack of living plants are probably the two worst things because that will lower organic matter. But definitely some of your your inputs are going to throw around. So if you're using fungicides, they will be knocking around the beneficial fungi because there's not really any selective fungicides or there's very few 
that are you know selective as such um but yes the softer the chemistry the better basically um, so here's a couple of steps to improving your soil health which is probably going to answer your question jared in a different way the first five steps which you have to do if you're in cropping this is is control your traffic minimize your tillage no bare ground and living roots are better than mulch so if you can have living cover crops and i know moisture is the big thing you've got to be balancing but anything's better than bare ground and living roots are better than uh, mulch most of the time. Uh, diversify, have it, getting some diversity in the system, not just year on year, the same thing. And then if you do have animals, don't just set stock planned. And so you can take them on and off so that the, um, the, the, the plants can build root systems if they're perennial. And then there's four recommended extras that are bonus kind of things that if you do them as well, I think it will improve soil health. The five, the first four, five were mandatory. If you don't do them, then Dave Hardwick's going to throw the chalk at you. But these are your four sort of extras. And one is you've got to then deal with soil chemical constraints. If you've got aluminium or sodium or another key sodic, uh, another key chemical constraint, sometimes you have to, put the soil amendment out and deal with that before you'll trigger that improvement. Uh, reduce your herbicides or agrochemicals. Try and reduce them as much as you can. Uh, and then this is number eight is where obviously people are using some biologicals. So if you're using biologicals as your main tool to improve soil health and you're still doing all the other things or not doing any of the other things, I think it's doubtful that you'll be doing anything other than minimizing tax, which is good. You need to minimize tax, but it might not necessarily be giving you much of an agronomic benefit. So really the stimulating, the stimulants and the biologicals kind of like they're just like icing on the top. They're kind of really auxiliary tools, if that makes sense. Definitely you do see them give some really impressive results at times, but I think they're kind of auxiliary support tools. And then number nine is balance and target your fertilizers. Yep, you're doing that really as best you can. Uh, Teresa said, I've heard, heard a few regen legends say, is that like state of origin regen legends? So recently that a good starting point is stop killing things. Yeah, definitely. I mean, living plant roots, I think, Teresa, is the key first fundamental thing. If you can have it as, for as long as possible in your crop cycle. Uh, that's all right if I tell you. I told, them, I told the guys I'd be making some stupid jokes, so I'm glad someone's liking it and I'm getting myself into trouble. So step three, so step one was know your soil type, know your soil type and the inherent fertility in it. Step two is build soil health. We just talked about a few things that you can do. And obviously it's doing more than one thing. It's the package deal. And I'm thinking about biologicals that are very expensive and that you have to buy from me. Anne's asked what sort of biologicals you're thinking. I'm gonna cover them in a sec. And then step three is estimate your available nutrients which is what you do already most of you i'm assuming you know available p available s so i'm not saying don't do that but i'm saying unless you've got really the best soil health and the best root systems and structure that you can get and you've fixed your aluminium or your sodium or whatever or low organic matter or whatever other issues or poor biology whatever other soil constraints you have then just focusing on step three alone is you know is going to be sub subpar from a best practice but yeah then we have to use soil tests, tissue tests, visual symptoms to work out, okay, do I have some limiting nutrients? Uh, and then you can use a COVID friendly fertilizer box. This one doesn't need any parts from China and you can increase your available levels of nutrients with, um, with fertilizers. If you've identified them as limiting your system, uh, you can add fertilizers like this apple grow is about to do. But I guess the key message that I'll keep banging on about is if you're, you want to try and increase the cycling of the nutrients already in your soil before you worry about adding them. Like if you're adding phosphorus and you have phosphorus there, but it's just poor, there's poor cycling of that phosphorus. Then if you don't try and improve that, then you're never going to be using your phosphorus fertilizer efficiently, I guess is the challenge. Um, so I guess make the most of what you already have. And that's where stimulants come in. So people, you know, when people buy stimulants, apart from because they're feeling hormonal, because there's green leaves and an earthworm on the packet. But apart from that, the other reason people are using stimulants is to try and trigger cycling of nutrients or plant roots. So if plant roots are growing, they're, they're giving out compounds into the soil, that's kickstarting that cycling process. So really stimulants and biologicals, most of the time they're used to try and improve what I call a nutrient cycling capacity. 
NCC. So they're just like a catalyst or a trigger. And sometimes you see them really impressive and other times you think, what a waste of money. And I used to do it as a living trial them. That was my job, compost teas, biologicals, rock phosphate. And there were times where I'd say, we shouldn't be selling this product into this market. It's not appropriate. And there were other times where there's no doubt that those as a tool, they were helpful tools, but you've got to look at price. You've got to look at, am I doing the other things as well? They're not magic bullets. Uh, canola doesn't have a fibrous root system as such, Doug. It certainly has a bit of a tap root. Uh, it can, it definitely does help um, probably, but the fibrous root systems tend to help with aggregation and the more tap rooted guys tend to help with busting through compaction layers. Um, but the, so that's why diversity is so good because you get all the different root morphologies or patterns and together you seem to get more than one plus one equals two. You kind of get that benefit of the diversity or that system change and you get one plus one equals like six from a structural point of view. And here again is a cane soil where they've got uh, soil health practices on the left and um, yeah, compaction on the right from sort of historical practices. Um, so if you have a small reserve of fertility though in your soil, then there's only so much you can access. You've got to be realistic. So if you're on a very low fertility soil type and you're trying, you know, you don't want to add fertilizers, then you have to be realistic about what your yield potential is. Um, even if you improve everything else like soil biology and structure, you know, there still may be a point at which you, you're limited by fertility. So, and I guess the final thing before I just touch on some of those stimulants and wind it up is um, managing soil fertility. We've also got to remember that plant available water is as much, if not the biggest limiting factor in dry land cropping systems. And I think focusing on structure is just as important as nutrients. And we've also got to have our nutrients cycling and those two things influence plant health um, quite significantly. And its yield is really important, but so is profit. Um, and profit comes down to efficiency of costs. Every dollar I save on the input side, on the cost side is a dollar to the bottom line, basically. So can I get that asset really functioning well? Uh, Craig, I have, we use one in our, Craig's asked, have you ever seen anything like a prioritization matrix? I like that term, Greg. I just say decision support tool to help decision making. Yeah, look, in the Digging Deeper courses that we run or that Soil Land Food runs myself and Simon and Christy who helped me, when we do them, we do have a kind of, um, you know, like what's, how do you address soil constraints in what sequence? Definitely. And, and that's the key thing, you know, what's the sequence of things you should do? And that's really what those steps were there that I put up before, the sort of five mandatory steps um, from what we've observed, what I've observed in my career and, and the growers that I've worked with is, you know, if you don't address that, then why are you doing this? Because you've sort of got the sequence out. So yes, we have a kind of eight step sequence for, that's for soil management to address soil health and things. But yeah, so we do have a bit of a matrix or, or ladder. Um, so just the last couple of things I wanted to talk about was fertility inputs. So last five minutes, uh, and then I'll, I'll shut up and you guys can throw things at me. Um, fertility inputs, so I call them rocks, salts, cordials, bugs, bruise, shit, dead bodies, and snake oils. You might know them as minerals, soluble fertilizers, liquid fertilizers, which is just a chemical in water like a cordial, ferments, manures, biofertilizers and stimulants. So I don't mind which terms you use, but they're the categories of things that people buy to put on their soil for soil or fertility management. So um, I'll just quickly summarize them. For fertilizers, you've got your soluble fertilizers, which is the ones that most people are familiar with, DAP, MAP, urea, um, whatever else you've got use, use an inside tech blend. They're usually highly soluble. Um, they will give you that quick fertility boost for the yield target that you have when they're used inappropriately they can throw around the soil function and it's really interesting to see the emerging research around particularly soluble nitrogen on soil soil community adaptive systems there's just been a really uh, interesting paper put out by road the roth hampstead in, in the UK called the theory of soil. They've called the paper. It's a very interesting paper. And what they've shown or in that paper's found is that when you put out too much soluble nitrogen, you, you stimulate the bacteria basically, and they respire more. So they get more active and breathe more CO2. So they sort of burn more of your soil organic matter into CO2. So 
you're kind of basically shutting down the humus process forming in the soil to sort of summarize it very roughly. But yeah, that's a really interesting paper. And I've seen some sugarcane work, very similar thing. And we know that if you put out too much soluble phosphorus, you can shut down the mycorrhizal processes as well for, for phosphorus accessing. But they do have a place. And Ian, I guess the debate is how much should I use and when do they become a problem, etc. They're usually more of a problem when your soil is already in poor condition because it can't digest and assimilate them. Uh, whereas when your soil is in really good condition, it can tolerate them. It's like me eating sugar. I shouldn't eat it. But when you're a kid, you can eat lots of sugar because your body just uses it up. But don't give sugar to kids. It's not a good idea. And then biofertilizers. They, my definition of a biofertilizer is a nutrient attached to carbon. So it's any like blood based product or anything where they've put carbon in with the nutrient so that it's more, it can be assimilated by the microbes in the soil because most of your fertilizer nutrients, when you put them in the soil, a good portion, if not the vast majority of them get digested by bacteria pretty quickly when they're soluble. And so adding some carbon just helps that bacteria to assimilate those nutrients and then they can cycle through your soil's mineralization process. Uh, and then the mineral fertilizers are the slow release mineral type products like rock phosphate. So then you've got your stimulants and I put the stimulants are things like seaweed, humates, bioferments. Here's a couple of guys making a humate product on farm. Uh, and then the other category of products are your inoculums that are living things like rhizobia bacteria for your legumes or mycorrhiza or compost tea. So you're actually looking to put things out that are living. And the question we all have is, if I put that out, does it really colonize and survive? And it's interesting that product from Bayer Crop Science, the Serenade product, which is starting to be marketed now. And um, yeah, they're marking it a, a bacillus, a bacteria. And I've heard mixed re reports from growers that are using it. Some are saying they're getting a response and others are saying it doesn't seem to be working. And that's the problem with biological products is that I think it's context specific. Uh, and the last category, sorry, I missed a picture, is soil amendments or ameliorants is the old fashioned word I think we used to use, like compost, lime, gypsum, dolomite, etc. Sorry, there's a typo there. And so basically we're usually using a soil ameliorant to overcome a soil constraint like uh, acidity or poor structure with gypsum or um, biology compost can help with that with organic matter etc so it's about yeah using oh there we are i did have a picture so here's a wheat trial with compost in the central west from a couple of years ago so it's about trying to improve soil health and and the biological products are, are used for that purpose but they're also used to help cycle nutrients that's the key thing people are using stimulants that help plant roots get active, which then drives nutrient cycling. So they can be used for different purposes. But usually the theory with the biologicals is if they've got green leaves on them or earthworms on the logo, don't worry about the economics of it. It's all good because it feels good to use. Now I'm just being a bit cynical. I definitely see there's a place for them. I know I'm getting myself into trouble. There's definitely a place for some of them. The question is be really clear what your agronomic goals are. Um, definitely. I think people of my personal opinion are using too much solubility for sure. Can the biologicals help us to, what we're really trying to do is um, rehabilitate soil function so that we get a really high functioning soil. And I think it's, it's, I think the challenge that we have is sometimes we're not sure how far we can improve our soils. And that vanilla paddock was a classic example because no one could quite believe that you could take a tropical soil in a three meter rainfall zone to 30% organic matter with such a high respiration microbial environment. And so I think, you know, I think there's a lot of areas of agronomy and soil management that, uh, that, uh, that we're just opening up now with the diversity cropping, uh, multi-species cropping and the biologicals. And you're, we're seeing results with some of the biologicals that you can't necessarily explain in with current science, but we kind of know from an ecological point of view, but we still got to validate it. And I think that's the challenge. As I said to you at the beginning, some of these things are early technologies um, and sometimes we're not sure what the mode of action is or why that's doing what it's doing. Um, but they definitely seem to be helping improve soil function. 
which then leads to better plant growth, more even plant growth. So sorry if I'm being a bit sarcastic of all the different things, but basically I think these new tools definitely have a place, but we're still learning about them. Uh, and the soil key, I'll definitely keep out of that one or I will get into trouble, Craig, for sure. I think my main opinion of soil key is that it's very context specific. So landscape, soil type rainfall is critical for that, for that to be a useful tool. I have seen it in action and I'm not sure that it's the right tool for a lot of different areas. Uh, it definitely the right tool for certain areas like high rainfall, reasonably moderate textured soils and perennial grasses pastures but is it a tool for other areas to rehabilitate or i'm i'm yet to be sort of to see the data because it's a disturbance it is a disturbance um, i'm mindful i'm being recorded but it's i call it a uh, a rotary hoe on yoga doing yoga because it's a it's a, it is quite it's not really intensive but it is you know there's a bit to it when they operate it so you know on a fragile light soil in a dry environment i yeah you'd have to be really careful and trial it i think um, before you're yeah, using it uh so yeah I'll, I'll finish up at that point sorry for listening and i hope hope it wasn't too random for you it felt like a bit of a random session um do you ever use a bricks meter yeah and from time to time yes yeah uh, it's again one of the tools in the monitoring toolbox um i think i think for me there's lots of different ways to monitor and i'm i'm a big believer in kind of looking looking at things holistically so looking at that in conjunction with other things as well uh, yeah so if your crop is in ideal prime mid crop moisture's there sun's there you, you you think all the ducks are lined up and so it should be really powering along to full genetic potential allison then i think that's when the bricks is and it's not got a good bricks at that point you're going okay why not and so it's sort of um yeah this is the thing if a plant's stressed then is you know, then I've got to be considering that while I'm reading the bricks meter. And Maria, who's I know was on here, she's still on here. Maria's doing a few bricks trials over at Aubrey. Maria works with me at, at um, Aubrey, and she's doing some bricks trials on a crop at the moment near Aubrey. And yeah, they're seeing things change depending on how cloudy it is and time of day, etc. But they're definitely a tool to to experiment with. Um, hi, David. Yeah. Um, back on. <laughs> Thank you. That was excellent. Um, and does anyone want to yeah, actually yeah. vocally have a question rather than typing it as well? That, that looks better because um, it might be nice to have an actual discussion rather than a chatted one. If anyone wants to have a chat. Yeah, David, I, um, I asked that because um, a couple of weeks ago I was out um, testing some multi-species pastures yeah. and was very pleased to know my bricks meter was working because I got lots of high values, but the plants were a bit stressed. So, and I just wondered what would have happened um, the week after when we had a rain. Yeah. Um, whether it would have come yep. back. Yeah. So d definitely moisture content because what bricks measures is it measures total dissolved solids. So if, if the plant, if the sap, if there's not as much sap, if the plant's a bit dry, then obviously you're concentrating your solutes in the sap flow. So that's one thing that influences it. Yeah, the moisture content, the time of the day too, because plants move, you know, uh, translocate stuff up and down, down to the roots in the afternoon sort of thing. So you've got to be mindful when you monitor. If it, if it gets cloudy, then that will change straight away in real time. The photosynthesis activity so you know half an hour after that so you got to, yeah you do have to be careful when using it as a monitoring which is the same for any monitoring tool isn't it really so yeah using it over time and and learning and it, it can then help you for sure like a, we were looking at a multi-species pasture was it yeah we were looking at some of the weed species in or used to be called weeds i'm not allowed to call them weeds anymore some of the the non-planted um, variety in the pasture and yeah they were doing a lot worse than the planted ones in one and then you'll see the opposite you'll see sometimes the weeds doing much better from a bricks point of view than the than the oats or the whatever the other or the um, tillage radish or whatever it is um, so yeah it's it's just sort of What's telling the theory you theory there well obviously that plant at that time is 
photosynthesizing higher so it's obviously happier in that condition that that better that adapted moment. to that well at that particular moment, moment of time exactly yeah. you know like it might be two weeks later that you know all the tillage radish start to power away because it's cooled a little bit or we've had a bit of rain now and the seasons change or as you know plants come up some years you get particular weed and then don't see it for five years and so you know there's all those those other aspects that can come into it as well but i think it yeah it's definitely part of the toolbox for sure um david i just wanted yep. to go back to the biological um yep. testing yeah so you're saying that those new tests are much better but have they actually got any sort of value of what's good what's bad like how yeah. many, how, many yep. of this and how many of that yeah, great question. Yeah, I, I guess I hope I can't remember my exact wording. I guess what I was trying to get across is that they're, the technologies they're using is showing a lot better potential because we're able to capture much more of the community. So the problem man's been like up until DNA sequencing, we really are, have only ever been seeing maybe 5% of the bacterial population in the soil uh, just because you know, a lot of them, it's impossible to culture them at all. So, um, so that's why it's exciting because that new technology, but the problem is that it's very new and there's still not database sets of, you know, bench for benchmarking. That's, that's part of the problem. So, you know, unless someone does a five year whole of nation trial to sort of start to get sort of target profiles or target benchmark community numbers and that's ongoing. And this is the problem with the soil biology. So they obviously they're doing it with a predictive predictor program for you know soil borne diseases um, but I guess the the slightly different perspective of of what we're trying to do here is not just look at the baddies but also what's our disease suppression or our whole community function potential you know take it from that whole angle and the cane industry did some work that's where some of the predictor b work came out of um, dr graham sterling who originally did the work in cane years ago 15 20 years ago where they had they had ratios between beneficial nematodes and pathogen nematodes. And so they kind of looked at the beneficials, not just the nasties. And so I guess what we're trying to do now is say, let's have a look at the whole community. But I was talking to Dr. Neil Wilson, who, who was with the University of Sydney, and he's involved with this DNA sequencing. He's one of the lead guys in it. It's still very early days. And this is the problem with even that. And that's the most world leading, you know, soil biology testing you can do because you know we're still trying to characterize the communities um you know this is the you know, we've got to come up with these benchmarks and all right well what should i be aiming for in this you know what's the pattern so the ones that you'll get now without getting myself into trouble the tests that you do now this is the question that we have and i've used them for the last 10 years and in particularly the barrier reef where we're spending lots of money on soil health projects so we're just mm -hmm. We've got heaps of money to spend. So we've been using these soil biology tests as part of projects and you still get trends that you don't expect. So out in the paddock is one thing. And then the, the worst performing treatment is the best on the soil biology numbers and you go and where's it going here? And yeah, so it's still early days and, and that's the reality. So I guess the best way to use them is as a trend sort of okay let me do it each year that's at the moment that's the best way you can use them because i'm not saying they're useless but they they are problematic to benchmark against that's our problem yeah yeah okay so um david my understanding yeah. is that um you know you can get a you can get a lab result which gives you the total population total yeah. population of bacteria and fungi or microbiology in the soil yeah. but you're not yeah. really understanding what's active when so, um, and so they might say, well, this is your total population, but in reality, um, because of whatever fungicides you've used or because of just whatever the soil type, yeah. the moisture in the soil, the temperature yeah. of the soil, you yeah. might only have a 10% active population or, yeah. or, or none even. You know, yeah, so. no, that's part of it, Felicity. And then the other part too is though, that the way they measure the the common way that's been used for total microbial biomass in the past is the respiration test. So how much CO2 has been generated. And that tells us nothing about the 10,000 or more potential species in that community, or is there only 1000? So what's, I don't know if you've read any of the, you know, latest on human microbiome and gut health and all that, but this, they're kind of like coming up with um, functional groups or types, sort of very broad type categories of of microbial types and then using that to kind of 
compartmentalize things. And that's just starting to happen in soils from what I can see and reading a few things, trying to keep up with it myself. Um, and so, yeah, it, that's the problem. If you do total microbial biomass, it's really done on a respiration test a lot of the time. And that doesn't give us any functional diversity feeling at all. It's like saying I've got 10% organic matter, but yeah, it's all in the form of wood chips. It doesn't give us a qualitative feel at all for um, what's going on. Do I have, and so the test that I've, the, the, the way they're trying to bring it all together is also then use enzyme testing in conjunction with it. So they'll go, okay, your total's okay, but also your phosphorus, your phosphatase, which is indicating phosphorus cycling is good too, or your nitro, you know, your nitrogen enzymes. So you can get a bit more of a complete picture, not just of what's there, but what function are they doing? Cause it's really, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, can this help me make a decision on my phosphorus? That's, that's where I want the salt test to help me with. Can I, do I need to, you know, is, have I got the best phosphorus cycling I can have for my soil type? those are the questions that are practical for, from a grower point of view. And that's what we used to do in the two thousands when we're doing what's called biological agronomy, trying to make, make these decisions, how much rock phosphate or how much can we lower our DAP here and get away with it? Because we think the soil's cycling pretty well. We just didn't have any tools. So, you know, we were going on very sort of rule of thumbs and all this sort of thing. It's, it's really tricky. So hopefully the soil biology testing technology can get to that point more than just disease suppression, which it's really useful for. Obviously the predictor program is really fantastic, but can we get to the next level and say, look, this soil's phosphorus cycling is eight out of 10, you know, it's great. Whereas this soil is much poorer. Um, so I can change my phosphorus approach or whatever, you know, that's where I think it needs to get to. That would be better than just looking at mycorrhizae for instance, wouldn't it? Yeah. Because yeah. high mycorrhizae might just say that's because you've got really high pH soils that's locking up all the phosphorus you're putting on and and that's why it's there compared to soils here where it's probably lower, but it's available. Whatever Correct. you put on is available. Yeah, and yeah, exactly, Alison. And, and all those those site contexts, you know, environmental factors come into it, you know, obviously, because the theory goes phosphorus will only release from acids. So, you know, the old, I remember the DPI, you, years and years ago so i'm not getting anyone into trouble saying uh, you know to get phosphorus to get rock phosphate to work you've got to be in an acid soil which was what the national rock phosphate research project in the 90s discovered or came to the conclusion but then you ask yourself in an alkaline ph of 8.5 to 9 naturally how does phosphorus cycle because the ecosystem has to be able to cycle it and again it's more the biological pathway dependent whereas in an acid soil those natural acid acidification processes can cycle it so there's more than one way it cycles and that adds a whole another layer to the soil biology testing but yeah it it's um, depends how quickly you need it yeah, exactly and what's which pathways are, are most prevalent in your soil type and your rainfall type yeah because that's work with them as best we can yeah yeah okay um is there anyone else got a burning question otherwise we might wind it up Craig's Craig. got one there from the UK. Craig, if you go onto Roth Hampstead Research, you know, I think I'm pronouncing it right. That's how I pronounce yeah. it anyway. Um, there is a, um, they've got a, they put their latest papers and it's one of them, one of the researchers, he used to work at Sydney Uni, but I think he's Scottish. I think his name's John McDonald. Anyway, if you go on there, you'll find it. They're calling it a theory of soil. Uh, if you just type theory of soil, Roth Hampstead, you'll get the, you get the summary paper. And it's basically that soils are self-organizing systems, you know, as which sort of been around in ecology for a few years, but it, it's a very different perspective on soils that if you have living roots and diversity, they will within limitations, organize the functioning topsoil, the whole community. So yeah, it's worth having a read of that for sure. Thanks Teresa uh, for that. Can, can we just go to that uh, Tay farm question there? Oh, uh, yep. Um, yep. Oh yeah, that's Maria. Yep, sorry, I missed that, Maria. Um, so, wanting high bricks on oak crops, Maria. Maria, do you want to answer that? Gone for dinner, or, or is it low and cape weeds high so that they eat the cape weed? Uh, so, hello. Um, so basically, uh, we want to um, pop the sheep on, and we did some tests, uh, spraying some fire fertilizers. Uh, and then testing the bricks to see what happens on the oats. And then we just basically want to see when is best to put the sheep on. And we found that um, when we didn't apply biofertilizer, 
the cape weed had a high brix to the oats and also it had um, on a in a in the morning when there wasn't any sun or during overcast days uh, the cape weed had a higher bricks than the oats so we came to the conclusion that we would put the sheep on um, when we haven't applied a biofert and uh, during overcast um, times so then there was less impact on the oats or more more of a uh, even impact you were hoping that they'd preferentially graze the cape weed on those days because yeah. it, it would be more sweeter. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then you get cape weed flavored lamb for the farm shop at TAFE. <laughs> yeah, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think Craig might be having another joke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Um, um, yeah. What, one of the growers at Raywood here noticed that too. Um, he'd measured it on the tillage radish compared to the cereal in there and they didn't touch the tillage radish in the first instance but as things progressed um, a few weeks later then they were eating that when that had risen as well so yeah, yeah. And, and Alison the other whole dynamic that really throws a spanner in that works is uh, dietary diversity and feedback signals to animal rumens that's work done by Professor Fred Provenza in the US so that just completely opens a whole other layer of this system that we're dealing with that's and that's the other really exciting for me emerging science that is there's a lot of good science behind that um, and how animals their room and gives them signaling feedback based on their the phytochemicals they're eating um, and their behavior their learned behavior to eat too so animals can learn to eat what we call weeds it might not necessarily be their main diet but they will include it as part of their browse whereas another mob of animals that's why you go to a field day and someone swears that they never eat that plant on their place and then the neighbor says oh they always eat it on mine it's it's it explains a lot of that process but i think that's that's another layer on top of this palatability on the day and the animals have evolved for cows, modern cows, about a 10 million evolution year evolution in landscape to eat phytochemistry and it's extremely complex. But Fred's work, yeah, he's written a book called Nourishment. That's, it's a fantastic I book. It. It's on my pile, but oh, I haven't it's, read it. It's <laughs> one, of the best, one of the best science books I think ever come out in the last 10, 15 years. It's an absolute cracker. If you're into animals and diet and nutrition, it, it absolutely smashes the, a lot of the theories or, or takes the theory of animal nutrition to a whole new, new place. Yeah. Okay. Well, David, um, yeah. it'd be really nice if we could actually have you out in the paddock one day too. So when yeah, all, no worries. all of this may be eventually over and borders are open and we're living in the, some sort of a different world. <laughs> Yep. Um, that would be good, but thank you very much for today. That was excellent.